Good morning, everyone. Okay, that works well. We're, we're, we're trying to start at sort of exactly at 11 o'clock, but just to check that everyone's in the right room, um, this is Money, 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 Dynamic Financing Solutions. So anyone who doesn't, isn't here for this or doesn't want to stay, um, please leave now, and then we <laughs> shall. <laughs> but I'm sure the title has, has got you interested, even if you didn't intend to be here. Um, we're going to have um, the presentations first. We're going to have them in a, in a row without questions in between because what we'd like is a really active discussion at the end um, with everyone participating. Um, the presentations are due to last 15 minutes, but I gather some are slightly shorter. Um, but each presentation has a maximum of 15 minutes, so hopefully we'll have a good 20 minutes at the end for discussion, So, and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that that happens. So we're going to be, begin with the first presentation. That's from John Stover. Um, John Stover, as you may know, leads the Avenir Health Group and has a, a long and distinguished um, history in HIV modelling and specifically has been one of the pioneers of using transmission models for economic analysis in HIV. Okay, thank you, Anna. <clears throat> so any of you who have read the new UNAIDS report will be familiar with this chart um, produced by Jose Antonio, who is sitting here, and his team, <clears throat> uh, that shows us the global financing for HIV AIDS programs um, <clears throat> from 2006 through today. <clears throat> and one thing that, that's striking is the different bars, parts of the bars are showing you the domestic financing, the um, PEPFAR, Global Fund, and others. <clears throat> and you can see that over the last six years or so, funding has been relatively stable, <clears throat> 18 to $20 billion a year. <clears throat> and then the red dot shows you the estimated resource requirements for 2020 to be on track for fast track. <clears throat> so two things I wanted to, to mention about this. One is that in spite of the fact that we've seen stable funding for the last six years or so, uh, we know that there's been measured progress. We know the number of people on ART has gone up dramatically over this period. We know that VMMC programs have really taken off, uh, voluntary medical male circumcision programs have really taken off. So we've, got, we've made progress even with stable funding. And how has that happened? Um, well, it's a combination of things, but one is programs are becoming more efficient, more cost efficient. We're learning to bring down the cost of reaching, uh, providing a service to each individual. Um, also, some of it has been due to reallocation of money away from lower priority programs to higher priority programs. So you might not be happy with that if you're working in what was <laughs> decided to be a low priority program. <clears throat> um, so my talk is is really going to be about um, our opportunities for continuing to improve cost effectiveness as we go forward into the future. But also notice the gap between where we are today and that red dot. And I don't want to leave you the impression that by continuing to improve the cost effectiveness of our programs, we don't need to achieve that red dot. Because that estimate represented by the red dot already includes an assumption that we improve the cost effectiveness of our program. So that's already built into the resource needs. So that is a true gap um, that we need to address. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk mostly about two types of um, <clears throat> cost effectiveness, technical or implementation efficiency and allocation efficiency, how we allocate our funds by intervention, by population, and by geographic location. And at the end, I'll just make one remark about management efficiency. So first, if we look at technical or implementation efficiency, <clears throat> um, see how well this chart comes out. So the chart on the left is showing you data for cost per sex worker reached. And the chart on the right is cost per person on ART. <clears throat> um, at the bottom axis, you're seeing regions. <clears throat> And then the dots represent an estimate of, let's say, the cost per sex worker reached in a particular country. We pulled together, together data from about 52 countries, and these data come from investment cases that were um, organized by UNAIDS and implemented by uh, the Burnett Institute in Australia using the Optima model, the East-West Center, um, <clears throat> Tim Brown and his team using the AEM model, and then my team at Avenir Health using the goals model. So we all pooled the estimates of unit costs um, that we had collected for those exercises, and that's what you see here. 
So the first thing to notice is the huge diversity of costs. <clears throat> um, you, you see some that are quite high, some that are quite low. Um, so these costs were collected through different methods. <laughs> Um, they might be measuring somewhat different things. There's different ways you can reach sex workers, different levels of quality. So that explains some of the difference. Um, but, and others might think, well, a lot of the difference is explained by income levels because salary levels are higher some places than others. But actually, if you look here at a, at a plot of cost per sex worker reached on the horizontal axis uh, versus GNP per capita on the vertical axis, you can see that there's really not that much relationship. So a lot of the scatter that we see here is not explained um, by typical factors that we expect to explain differences in unit costs. What that suggests to me is that while a lot of our programs are very cost effective, um, there is certainly scope in many countries for comparing your costs against those at neighboring countries and understanding where your high costs and how you might go about um, improving that. <coughs> Okay, then I want to talk about allocative efficiency. And to do this, we took our mathematical simulation model called GOALS, and we applied it to 56 countries, all are global fund eligible countries. So we wanted to focus on those countries that, uh, that use a significant amount of international resources as opposed to, say, Brazil, which mostly funds its own program, so that we could look at both <coughs> allocating across interventions but also uh, across different countries. <coughs> So we fit the model to historical epidemics in each country, <clears throat> and then we calculated the cost effectiveness by scaling up each of <clears throat> 13 interventions one at a time and calculating the cost of that scale up and then the infections averted, deaths averted, and dollies averted um, by that scale up. <clears throat> um, and we scaled things up to fast track targets by 2020, and then we measured impact from today through 2050. <clears throat> So that combination, not every intervention is, is um, sensible in every country, but the combination of interventions and countries essentially generated 700 estimates of the cost effectiveness of an intervention and a country combination. <coughs> and the costs and impacts are discounted at 3% annually. So this is just a schematic of the goals model. It's a mathematical simulation model. It's a compartment model that looks at um, – population in a country or a region disaggregated by population type, uh, key populations, those with multiple partners, those who have one steady partner. And for each population group, we describe their behaviors, and from that we calculate likelihood of transmission and new infections. And then the boxes across the bottom are the interventions, and the two uh, boxes in the middle, so this one for biomedical interventions, these are interventions that um, – affect the transmission by, in, by changing the probability of transmission per contact. <clears throat> so condoms or PrEP, ART, et cetera. And then we also have behavior change interventions that act by changing the behaviors that put people at risk, not the uh, uh, transmission per contact. So this is the model that we applied to these 52 countries. <clears throat> and we studied 13 different interventions. Um, these are all interventions that have a direct impact on transmission. There's lots of other things we do in HIV programs where, that are not designed to have direct impact, uh, but enabling or management, research, et cetera, that also cost money. We're not looking at those here. We're looking at just the, the funding for the direct impact programs. <laughs> okay, so hopefully you can get a sense of what this, um, this chart looks like. Each across the bottom, we have the different interventions. So there's ART is the first uh, set of dots, and then behavior change communication, condoms, MSM program, outreach to MSM, opioid substitution therapy, PrEP programs for people who inject drugs, sex workers, and voluntary medical male circumcision. <clears throat> so each dot is showing you the cost per infection averted, <clears throat> um, and the color of the dot for a particular intervention, and the color of the dot uh, represents the region. So the green dots are for East and Southern Africa. Um, the red dots are for Asia Pacific. So what can we learn from this? Um, well, several things. First of all is every intervention is cost effective somewhere. <laughs> um, there's a huge variation again, and some of this variation comes from the variation of unit costs that we've already seen. 
Some of it comes from variation in the epidemic context in which these are implemented, and others come from the efficiency and the, and the selection of interventions. <clears throat> um, when we look across all of these, we can see some that are consistently cost-effective. Condom programs, um, OST, outreach to sex workers, voluntary medical male circumcision consistently come out um, in almost all settings as very cost-effective programs. <clears throat> so ART is on this list. Even though we're looking at cost per infection averted, we re recognize that ART uh, has other benefits in terms of averting mortality. And when we do this in terms of cost per death averted, you know, ART gets selected everywhere. Um, so we're focusing just on infections averted here. Still, ART is, is a cost-effective program, and it also includes PMTCT. PMTCT is not on this list because it's really ART these days, so the effect through PMTCT is also here. And then there's also a star next to East and Southern Africa because um, if you look at the colors of the dots, you can see that the most cost-effective programs, um, uh, there's a abundance of cost-effective programs in East and Southern Africa. This is because incidence is highest in this region, and also costs are relatively low compared to the rest of the world. So, um, so that's why we see that. So now a few charts just to try to make some sense out of all these data points. So in this one, this is a stacked bar, so this, the portions of the bar represent the different interventions. And the first bar on the left shows you the most cost-effective 10% of the interventions. What are they? You can see the distribution. The next bar shows you the, the next most cost-effective 10% and, and all the way up. So one of the points that you can get from this is that the most cost-effective interventions don't require a lot of money. It's much less than 10% of the funds required to implement those interventions, which is a clear signal that you know, we should be doing those. <laughs> So if I switch those bars now and make them the distribution, so out of 100% of the money required to implement the best um, cost-effective programs, where do the funds go? And you can see here in the most cost-effective uh, column, it's, the, it's condoms, female sex worker outreach, OST, and VMMC. And you can see that the condom programs, for example, are almost all um, clustered in the, the first 10, 20, and 30%. In other words, those programs are cost-effective almost everywhere. Same thing with the VMMC programs. <clears throat> um, we see ART coming in here um, later on and taking a big chunk of the resources, obviously. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if I look at the percentage of infections averted by each of these 10 percent uh, percentiles of uh, infections, you can see this in the dash line. So the best 10 percent required only a few percentage of, of the total resource needs. Um, but provides about 10% of all the infections averted by implementing everything. <clears throat> so we get good impact from these most cost-effective programs as well. And then finally, um, this same chart, but now instead of showing you by intervention, we're showing you by region, by geographic region. <clears throat> and one point to take away from this is that there are cost-effective buys, cost-effective interventions in all regions. So it's not that we should just send all of our money to Southern Africa. <laughs> That's not uh, the case at all. There are good buys in every region, <clears throat> um, although um, the resource needs are dominated by Eastern Southern Africa. <clears throat> so the main point I think we're trying to get out of all this is it's very context-specific. And countries should know their costs, and that's actually a big step first. <laughs> so many countries don't actually know what it costs to deliver their services. <clears throat> So countries should know their costs, and they should do some type of analysis like this to figure out where they're going to get the most impact for their funding. And it's going to be different in each country, so you can't just look to global guidelines and say, oh, we should be doing this in our country because that's what the global guidelines suggest. <laughs> so uh, final slide on key results. 17% <clears throat> um, of the intervention country combinations we looked at are cost savings. What that means is that the cost of implementing the program is more than offset by the savings that we will receive by not having to treat people who don't get infected. <clears throat> so that happens in the future. You have to take a little longer-term view to see the savings, but they are cost savings. So that's, that's the great thing, and we certainly ought to be doing those, um, <clears throat> those uh, interventions. Most cost-effective programs are in East and Southern Africa. I mentioned that already. <clears throat> 
Among the most cost-effective interventions, condoms, VMMC, outreach to sex workers, to fully fund these interventions requires only 15% of total resources. <clears throat> but today, we're only funding them at about a 70% level. <clears throat> so there is some scope to do a better job here of, um, <clears throat> of directing funding to those interventions that are going to have the biggest impact. And the last point is that <clears throat> there's another component of our HIV budgets, which is for management, administration, um, program support, training, research, M&E, um, all those different activities that we all know about. And they take from 10 to 25 percent of the funding goes to these support activities. And we really have no idea what is ideal. How much do we need? Are we underfunding or overfunding those programs? So it's, a, it's an area of research, um, I think, that's sort of been left behind because it's difficult to do but it's important for us to get a handle, better handle on as we look to making our programs more cost-effective in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to welcome Tavi. Tavi also works for the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation in um, uh, Seattle. Um, and she's going to talk about forecasting um, the cost of financing ART in sub-Saharan Africa under different funding scenarios. All right. Thank you, Anna. Um, I'm Tavi. I'm here from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and I'll be presenting on research done by myself and my colleague, Austin Carter, on forecasting the cost of financing ART in sub-Saharan Africa under differential funding scenarios. So to give some context for our study, we want to take a look at current HIV financing levels in Sub-Saharan Africa. So government funding for HIV, represented by uh, blue in this chart, has been stagnating, and development assistance to health has been decreasing, represented by red. Uh, this is a look at total HIV spend in Sub-Saharan Africa through 2015 uh, from a recent analysis done at IHME that was presented yesterday. Uh, though improving treatment options and longer lifespans for people living with HIV are a huge global health success, this also results in increasing prevalence and treatment needs. Less than 60% of people living with HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa are currently receiving treatment, which tells us that current funding levels aren't sufficient for meeting global health targets and makes the recent decreases in funding much more alarming. So with this study, we want to examine the impact of different HIV funding scenarios on future prevalence and cost of treatment. So we predict the cost of financing ART for 46 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa through two major steps. First, we want to estimate future ART coverage using projected ART price and country health expenditure, which we project under a better, worse, and reference scenario. Uh, so we let differences in health expenditure drive differences in ART coverage in the future. Then we run a population projection model for all three scenarios using predicted ART coverage as an input. This model estimates the number of people living with HIV to 2040 and allows us to compare the resulting differences in prevalence under each funding scenario. So in order to model future ART coverage, we began with predicting ART price. Uh, we used country-level data from the Global Price Reporting Mechanism, a resource from WHO, from 2004 through 2016. One thing to note is that this data only includes cost of the drug. It doesn't account for cost of administration or other costs associated with care. We used a stochastic frontier analysis as a bound for minimum ART price over time and then Gaussian process regression to complete the time series and project into the future. Uh, this plot is showing median ART price over time along with the range of price across countries. So we see that over time we expect uh, ART price to converge to a lower value across countries. To project health expenditure on HIV, we calculated annualized rate of change of per capita development assistance to health for HIV using 2010 as the reference year and government health expenditure as source using 1996 as the reference year. So we really wanted to look at the average rate of change 
of each source of funding for each country. We then took the 15th, 50th, and 85th percentile rates of change from across countries to project future funding in each country. So we wanted to see how all countries would look if all countries changed at the same rate as countries in the middle of the distribution as well as the upper and lower ends. We translate projected government health expenditure and development assistance to health for HIV into a proxy for ART dose equivalents per year by dividing funding by projected ART prices. We use a regression to model the relationship between health expenditure and ART coverage rather than directly translating funding into coverage since our treatment price estimates don't account for cost of administration as well as a number of other factors that make it difficult to directly translate funding into treatment. So we predict coverage at a CD4 specific level. Looking at Malawi as an example country, we see substantial differences in coverage across all CD4 groups between the three scenarios. The population projection model that we use takes incidence as an input, so we needed to predict incidence. We propagate the impact of differential HIV spending in our uh, population production model, both through ART coverage along with the effects of improved coverage on uh, incidence. So we project the counterfactual trend in incidence using the same rate of change approach that we used for health spending. So we want to calculate what the secular trend in incidence is uh, in the absence of ART in the past and then project that into the future using the 50th, 85th, and 15th percentiles from across countries. Um, and then we account for changing ART coverage and our final projected incidence input so that we see declines in incidence with improvements in coverage. In order to produce predictions of HIV prevalence, we input projected ART coverage, incidence, and a number of other projected demographic and coverage inputs through the Spectrum model. Spectrum is a cohort component model used by UNAIDS that we've modified to incorporate CD4-specific treatment probability, as well as a number of other methods developments originally made for the Global Burden of Disease study. Spectrum ages a population over time using demographic parameters while applying HIV incidence, disease progression, and mortality. So taking a look at our Malawi example, in the reference scenario, incidence rates were projected to uh, modestly decline, while prevalence rate was predicted to decline in all but the worst scenario. Taking a look at the distribution of future prevalence rates across countries in Africa, we still see prevalence largely concentrated in the southern portion of the continent, with rates in the worst scenario reaching as high as 35% in Swaziland. We also see a growing epidemic in central and eastern sub-Saharan Africa in the worst scenario. In the better scenario, we see a much more controlled epidemic in the southern portion of the continent, with the uh, prevalence rates dipping below 8% in Zimbabwe and Namibia, and below 5% in Mozambique. And the highest prevalence rate in the better scenario was uh, in Swaziland at 13%. So although pre uh, prevalence rates were projected to decline in all but the worst scenario, the number of people living with HIV was projected to increase across all three scenarios, which was largely driven by increasing population and longer lifespans for people living with HIV. Looking at Malawi, the number of people living with HIV is projected to almost double from just over 1 million in 2016 to 2 million in 2040 in the reference scenario. Similarly, looking at the totals across Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people living with HIV was projected to increase from just over 26 million in 2016 to over 40 million in 2040. Comparing the number of people living with HIV in the better, worse, and reference scenarios reveals the huge impacts uh, that increased funding could have. So across Sub-Saharan Africa, the number of people living with HIV varied from 29.1 million in the better scenario 
to 81.2 million in the worst scenario. Uh, so looking at the three countries projected to have the highest numbers of people living with HIV, which were South Africa, Nigeria, and Tanzania, along with their predicted price of ART drugs gives an idea of what it would cost to provide treatment in the future. So looking at the hypothetical cost of providing ART for all people living with HIV in 2040, um, we see really large differences between the scenarios. So taking South Africa as an example, we see a difference of $140 million per uh, year, looking between the reference and the worst scenario. And something across all countries, uh, we estimate that it would cost just over $1 billion to provide treatment in the reference scenario and over $2 billion in the worst scenario. So almost double the spending on ART drugs alone comparing between the uh, reference and worst scenarios. So coming to our conclusions, uh, we see that despite projected declines in incidence rate, the number of people living with HIV is predicted to increase, uh, which is breaking it down into the factors that are driving this, uh, primarily because of demographic changes and longer lifespans for people living with HIV. Uh, though the number of people living with HIV is predicted to increase across all three scenarios, the worst scenario uh, really shows the dramatic consequences of reducing funding into the future, uh, since we see triple the number of people living with HIV compared to 2016. The better scenario, on the other hand, uh, provides some evidence for the potential for sustained funding to lead to decreased prevalence and future savings on treatment. Some limitations in our study. We only predicted the price of ART drugs rather than comprehensive cost of care. Um, and at the time that we were doing this study, we didn't have data on government health expenditure specific to HIV. So if we were to redo the study, we would be able to use the um, new analysis done from IHME. And our study really only looked at the relationship between funding and coverage. We didn't look at the impact of other interventions on future prevalence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavi. And now I'd like to welcome um, Daniel. Daniel is the Eastern Africa Coordinator for the Swedish Workforce Workplace HIV AIDS uh, Program. Daniel's going to present on a catalytic funding model that was used to sustain financing for this program. Welcome, Daniel. <coughs> Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> today we are talking about dynamic financing solutions. My name is Daniel Maura, I come from Kenya, and I coordinate the Swedish Workplace HIV AIDS program in the Eastern Africa region. Uh, I'm going to focus on the aspect of funding <clears throat> within the model of the program that we have, not only in Eastern Africa, but also in the 11 Sub-Saharan African countries where we operate. Uh, the program is actually a private, uh, public-private partnership <coughs> between uh, two partners in Sweden, International Council of Swedish Industries and IF Metal, which is a trade union, <coughs> Swedish Industrial Metal, Metal Workers Union, and is funded by CEDA, the Swedish International Development Agency. We are in 11 Sub-Saharan African countries divided into regions, Eastern Africa, Southern Africa, and South Africa. And basically, the goal of the program, as it was set up, is to work with the uh, private sector to engage them to respond to the issues of HIV and AIDS <coughs> at the workplace for the employees, their family members, and also to reach out to the communities where they are operating. Uh, we basically there for came in to support them to design programs around issues of collaboration between management and workers to implement the programs. Because we, we argued that um, if <coughs> there is good collaboration between management and workers, then the programs can be successful. And therefore, they go on to design activities around 
HIV AIDS education, employee assistant program, peer education programs, uh, and so forth. Just like uh, we see predominantly happening with many interventions in workplaces. But then <coughs> coming close to talk about the financing model, the funding that we, we have, we kind of use it as seed money to catalyze the process so that the companies can uptake <coughs> and engage in these programs and be able in the long term to sustain them as we exit. And therefore, we come in starting on a high note of a co-funding and then we reduce the funding with time <coughs> as the companies increase their funding. And so we take them through cycles, cycles of like, for example, during the first year of implementation, <coughs> they submit to us uh, their budget for activities, which we co-fund at 60%. The second year we co-fund at 50%. <coughs> then the third year or third cycle, we co-fund at 40%. And then they are supposed to have increased their funding and be on their own to sustain them. So that even as we exit, therefore, it means they can continue. We also don't kind of don't give them money up front, but we rather give them on reimbursement basis. And therefore, it's, it's possible to track on their actual expenditure that goes into the programs for the specific activities that they plan. And therefore, we can only therefore <coughs> finance the actuals that they spend on their budgets. And so, uh, I, I looked at uh, the funding <coughs> for 2005, <coughs> 2016, and 2017 within the different uh, lines. Uh, to mention here is that uh, <coughs> we developed some tools for the companies to be able also to capture <coughs> What is it that they are spending <coughs> in, term, <coughs> sorry, in terms of time input into the program activities <coughs> on other what would call like uh, non direct non-monetary, thank you, non-monetary terms. Because then, I mean, working private sector, everything counts. When they attend activities, when they participate, that to us also interprets as time input that can be translated into monetary terms. And so we came up with tools to be able also to capture that. And so <coughs> we also have been documenting that. And I looked at what is the overall investment that is coming from the companies against what we have been investing. And uh, this is like a summary of it in, in, in a snapshot where you can see <coughs> that from 2015, moving 2016 and 2017, that the companies actually have been able to increase their, fund, increase their funding and overall compared to what is actually going into the programs coming from SWAMP as a program funding, is becoming actually minimal. <coughs> and this is a, a, a justification that um, the catalytic model has been working pretty well in terms of these companies being able to appreciate the value of the programs, put more resources, <coughs> and be able to sustain them themselves. Um, the, 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 the finances that is reflected here is categorized in terms of uh, the total uh, in company investments in terms of one, the claims that are coming to us <coughs> to reimburse them for what they have done specifically that is going into their program activities. Then there is a calculation on time investments uh, that comes from attending workshops, uh, uh, to trainings like that. And then also there is money that they spend also when they conduct community outreach programs there is also other costs related like when they are doing promotions, when, for example, they would even use their venues to conduct certain trainings. So we try to capture that and convert it into monetary terms. But then <coughs> it also excludes certain lines of costs 
that would uh, actually maybe uh, confound a bit uh, of, the, of this analysis. So we leave out that uh, medical cost, for example, because then it's all inclusive and may not speak directly to HIV AIDS. And then of course, some companies would also have direct donations to the communities. So we also don't, uh, I, I not also look at that. But then, then there is a swap for funding itself. And of course, uh, there is variation over the years because companies may start the core funding and move within the cycles without generally completing the cycles annually. And therefore, a company may start a cycle this particular year, lag a bit based on they probably have some challenges, and then carry on into the second year. We've also seen like um, variations in claims. Uh, again, it's what they budget for. And at the same time, there are also variations in terms of what they get in terms of capacity building from the program. There, there has been some challenges also in terms of uh, companies being able to follow the model successfully because, for example, of uh, cash flows not being consistent, uh, economic downtimes, for example, companies may go through challenges, may need to reprioritize, therefore, they are not consistent always in the claim that comes to us, but we still stick to the percentage. Then, of course, of course, I mentioned about the inconsistency within the fund funding period. Uh, generally, uh, from the funding then, and last year, you can see the reach in terms of numbers. Uh, they, they do a lot of in-house activities targeted to their employees. They also do like family programs. They also reach, uh, you know, out to uh, the uh, community in various ways. And we have been able also to document that uh, every year, every year to see what are they reaching, what are they doing with these resources. And so this is a classic case, I would say, of a catalytic model that has actually led to increased financing from the private sector because most of these companies, as they get uh, into these programs, sometimes they are apprehensive. They don't know what they're about to gain. But with time, they appreciate, and when they start registering returns, then they are able to commit and continue. Uh, in the absence of the challenges mentioned, we have seen quite very good consistency with some companies that have gone through the cycles. They can quantify what they have achieved. And just recently, there has been a study to look at return on investment, sampling some companies from South Africa uh, with Karolinska Institute. And uh, you can see that they have been able to quantify that there is a return on investment of 44.8% of investing in, in these programs. So, and besides that is a whole uh, host of lessons that comes out of the program in terms of being able to reach to family members, community, the private sector contributing to what the existing national frameworks of response, uh, improved uh, workers' management relationships, and also being able to inf influence the general working environment. Uh, it's an effective mentorship model because then we encourage them that once they exhaust their finding cycles with us, that they should also be, become mentors of others. They should reach out to their supply chain and also help them to see the good side of implementing and to, catalyze, to also catalyze them. Uh, so as a way forward then is to spread the experience to inspire others through mentorship programs, dissemination forums like these ones. But also we want to see if what we, we have been doing can also inspire the informal sector, probably through the main of, uh, formal companies being able to reach to the informal sector. It's a good advocacy tool when we can be able to quantify the returns on investment, but also that there can be increased uh, private sector funding and sustainability of the programs. The model is also useful because it's a, an infrastructure that can also be used to even do other programs in, in line with SDGs because then it's a big network. They learn from each other, they challenge each other, and they always want to 
be the best in their programming. So thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. I'd now like to welcome Andrea, Andrea, um, who's a researcher at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. And And Andrea's going to talk um, about optimizing resource allocation for HIV prevention programs and is going to present a proof of concept. Thank you. Okay, so um, good afternoon to everyone. Um, in today's brief talk, I would like to present to you the, the case of Mexico, a country that has already passed through a financial transition from international donor funding to a domestic reliance and um, has a shift uh, su successful in the better optimization of uh, resources, of limited public resources. So um, I would like to start this um, story of Mexico um, in relation with the Global Fund. And uh, we all know that in uh, 2002, the Global Fund was created to fight against HIV, malaria, and uh, tuberculosis. And since then, uh, we can see in the, in the blue line that uh, the resources has, um, have growth. Nevertheless, the rate of growth has in fact decreased. And several events uh, changed or shaped the story of the Global Fund. So we know that in uh, 2000, between 2008 and 2009, a financial uh, global crisis raised questions regarding the sustainability of the Global Fund model. And as a result, uh, at the end of 2011, um, the Global Fund um, changed the the allocation criteria. And given that, uh, well, one of the criteria was that um, upper uh, middle level countries uh, were not eligible anymore to receive money. And Mexico, as part of the G20 countries, um, stopped receiving money from the Global Fund since uh, 2013, which was the, the year of transition. So uh, the Mexican government since uh, 2014 took control of the HIV prevention program. So uh, in this context of uh, moving or transit from international donor funding to domestic reliance, CENCIDA, which is the National Center for the Control of AIDS in Mexico, um, create a new public policy process. And what, I, what we can see in this uh, graphic is, or what I would like to highlight, is a policy design that CENCIDA took into account. Designing a policy instrument, basically, which consists of a, a public call, a public invitation for CSO, civil society organizations, to propose HIV prevention um, projects to be founded. And CENCIDA um, has the freedom to list the main specifications and requirements that these uh, projects should have in order to be founded. Um, regarding the implementations before and after the transition, uh, the implementation um, has been done by CSOs, by civil society organizations. It's, it's a quite important point. And um, the, the evaluation, it's um, exactly the, the part of the process where a research team took a major role because since the transition, this program uh, hasn't been evaluated. So in order to do so, our team uh, took into account or adopted um, um, a, a, a framework that proposes, this, this framework was proposed in uh, 2008 and proposed that the level of efficiency should take into account simultaneously um, three dimensions the cost effectiveness, the targeting, and the technical efficiency. And for our, um, uh, for our purpose, we defined cost effectiveness. So we said, well, if we have limited resources, which interventions should be prioritized uh, given their, 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 their best benefits at their lowest, uh, at their lowest cost? Uh, sorry. And then for targeting, uh, we defined two subcategories, which one 
was to who and where. So to who basically is which key populations are most at risk and then targeting if we could identify geographical zones uh, with, uh, with highest burdens. And then technical efficiency basically deals with the best use of resources. So um, providing HIV prevention interventions, you would like to take the most out of resources. So as an evaluation, as it is, we define two indicators. So one is what we call the benchmark, uh, which basically is what it should be, and an observed indicator that depicts what is really happening. Um, then in the following slides, in the following minutes, I'm going to take some time to, to show you the results from this evaluation uh, of the Mexican case. So the results in the dimension of cost effectiveness. So here we can see um, the most cost effective interventions ranked um, uh, according to their, their cost effectiveness. And this is for concentrated epidemic contexts, such as the Mexican case. And we can see in the, in the other side, the interventions that were provided in Mexico during uh, 2015, 2016, we can see that behavioral interventions were the most uh, provided and in second place, uh, testing and counseling. And then for targeting in the first category, we have um, to who, okay? So which key populations? And in order to do so, our benchmark was defined by two indicators, the HIV prevalence and the size of population as a proxy of the potential people to be infected for HIV. And the observed indicator um, was the, the people actually reached. So for the case of Mexico, uh, there are three key populations that were receiving less funds than it should be transgender and transsexual people, MSM, and general population. And then for the geographical targeting, here we have a nice map of Mexico. And the darker colors uh, depict the, the highest HIV incidence rate. So we can see that in Mexico, it's quite concentrated in the um, Yucatan Peninsula. And as a proxy of the attention, uh, here we can see a map uh, of Mexico um, of any kind of intervention, so the number of interventions of any kind. And we basically, we can see that the, the color doesn't correspond. So darker colors uh, in the HIV prevalence doesn't correspond with the lighter colors that we can see in the Yucatan Peninsula. And uh, this, um, it's quite important in Mexico. It's the, the interventions are more uh, focused in Mexico City, Jalisco and Nuevo Leon, which, has, which are the biggest states. And then uh, finally, for the technical efficiency, we used a pretty uh, descriptive um, approach. So basically, we split the sample, uh, the sample into quartiles of uh, coverage. So we control for the level of service scale. And we defined our benchmark is basically the 25th percentile of the average cost cost distribution. And um, we can see that it's quite conservative. We could use the minimum cost, but uh, we decided to define this benchmark, this most efficient observation as the 25th percentile. And then the observed indicator is a uh, weighted average cost for the sample above that. So we can, so we have the most um, efficient and the inefficient. And then the um, Graphically, if we calculate the difference between the benchmark and the observed indicator, we can see the potential savings. Um, that is a proxy of uh, the inefficiency that are occurring. And in this case, for the HTC, for HIV um, counseling and testing, it ranges between 60 and 40%. For the rest of the interventions um, identified, it ranges also between uh, 40 uh, 70 percent. And then uh, finally, so the first discussion would be what are the principles uh, findings? Well, um, we can see uh, that most of the interventions are provided were not the most cost effective. Um, that population that are at the at most of risk uh, at risk uh, uh, didn't receive the proportional amount of funding. That um, uh, the program or the policy instrument um, does not focus on the geographical regions. And um, as we showed, uh, as I showed in the later slides, um, 
there, there is evidence of technical inefficiency. So what happened in Mexico with these findings? So we communicate um, these results to the, to the stakeholders and they, and they decided to redesign um, the policy instrument that is, um, that, that this policy instrument is you know, implemented on a yearly basis. So it was used to redefine and tune up uh, in 2017 and 2018. But uh, what I would like to, um, uh, well, to take more time to talk about, it's what we can learn from the Mexican experience. So we know that it's, uh, it's a country that has already passed through a financial transition and the Mexican government um, designed a policy instrument. Uh, and this policy instrument uh, really has the, the, uh, the capacity to facilitate, as we saw, the economic uh, sustainability, but, but uh, also also an operational sustainability that deals um, more with the effective management of the CSOs, uh, to the capacity to of the CBOs to implement interventions, to work with groups, or to go to different geographic areas, and also mechanisms to create and enhance um, capacity among those CSOs. Um, another thing that show us it's that it's um, a policy instrument that it's quite transparent because the uh, Censida, the the National Center, um, displays the main requirements in an official document, so the CSOs uh, knows exactly what are going to be the requirements each year. It's quite uh, competitive because it incentivizes CSOs um, looking for funding, and finally. Um, this, this scheme um, permits or allows um, the generation of quite quality information um, to make strategic decisions on a yearly basis. So um, it could be, this is quite important to uh, direct and to redirect the response to the uh, HIV uh, fight. So thank you so much. Thank you. Andrea, um, if anyone has questions, I think make yourself ready. I'm just going to provide a brief summary and then I'll take a couple of questions at the time so you guys have a chance also to prepare your responses. Um, we saw from Tavi that there's a flat lining of development assistance for health and even a decrease for HIV. Um, Annie showed us that there actually is potential space going forward and she was using a method, one of many methods, but probably quite a conservative method of making this estimate compared to other methods which are kind of fiscal space um, methods. So in, in some sense, even though funds are going down, there seems to be a potential from domestic financing. Um, Tavi also showed us the consequences of not realizing this financing in terms of future um, consequence in terms of the numbers of people needing ART if we accept that everyone needs ART. And I know there's other work that looks at that consequence in terms of fiscal liabilities and say once we've made that commitment, that's a substantial fiscal liability. Um, Daniel showed us a nice example of how to sort of tap into alternative sources of financing, particularly private sector financing. And Andrea showed us about how countries can deal with this transition if they're transitioning out of um, development assistance for health. Um, three of the presentations dealt with technical efficiency and the costs of delivering different services. What I found was interesting is even though we know there's a lot of variation, one of the presentations showed that a lot of this might be driven by quality. I mean, we all know it's driven by scale. But I think a challenge for us working in this area is to really determine which part of that variation is due to quality and which part is due to inefficiency. So I found that particularly nice. And two of the presentations dealt with something we call allocative efficiency and looked at different allocations between different services and the mismatch between what is most efficient in terms of either preventing lives or preventing infections averted compared to current um, financing. What was quite interesting to me in, in those two presentations, the first presentation didn't really use a metric. It was looking very much within HIV programs, whereas the second presentation from Mexico looked at a metric called cost per quality. Now, the cost per quality metric, for those who are less familiar with this area, is something that we can use to compare to other disease areas. So I think you know, allocative efficiency is not just within HIV programs, but is about the value compared to other investments as well. And finally, we also talked about targeting 
um, and one of the presentations dealt with that. But I know there's wider economic work looking at equitable um, funding across different popul population groups. That raises that question. So I hope that's a useful summary because we've had a lot in a row. And now I'm going to take the first two questions and hopefully we'll get up. Uh, Marcus, I see you as well. So we'll take two at a, at a time. And please go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jose Antonio Sasola. I now work in UNAs, but I used to work in Mexico and San Cida. A couple of questions. Uh, Tavi, uh, for your presentations that you presented the price of drugs from the Global Price Reporting Mechanism, I, 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 perhaps I missed that, but how did you uh, adjust for other uh, procurement mechanisms? Because the JPRMS only is for major procurement agencies, and it has a voluntary reporting uh, uh, population of the database. So how did you adjust for the other procurement mechanisms? And for Andrea, just a couple of, uh, uh, one question and uh, one comment. Uh, the question is, I saw that one of the major uh, cost categories was mass media. But since 2012 in Mexico, most of that was for, uh, to promote uh, uh, demand, for demand creation and not that much for prevention as such. So did you adjust for that? Uh, second point is the, the, um, the global fund uh, contributions uh, it lasted for a very short period of time, and it was just for 3% of the total uh, budget expenditure in Mexico, the total budget for HIV. Uh, but the only part which is programmable, subjected for programming, is the competitive mechanism. And uh, uh, I, don't, I wonder if an analysis of just that part could help to understand the better allocation, because the other is more a fixed uh, cost that you cannot easily change. Thank you. And Maybe the lady next in green. Welcome. Um, introduce say your name and where you work before you ask your question. Hi, thanks. I'm Catherine Kripke from Avenir Health. And my question is for Dr. Frank. Um, so that it was interesting where, that you were projecting the ART costs were going down over time. But I was wondering, um, or I'd like to recommend that in your next iteration that you look at um, how the AR ARV costs would um, be different in the event of antiretroviral resistance. You know, when you have to start intro introducing new drugs and not just using the same drugs over time, because that's a big thing that's that's happening. It's something we can't necessarily stop. So it, it'll change your projections pro pro substantially, potentially. Thank you. Two great questions. Maybe we go from this side to that side and answer the questions in order. Sure. So. Um, kind of in response to both of those questions, um, they, we feel like there are a lot of unknowns with drug cost looking into the future. So the way that we projected drug price, um, there are a few ways that we could improve our methods for doing that, but we were also using drug cost as more of a means to an end to show uh, relative differences like that were being driven by future prevalence, more so than really providing exact predictions of what countries should be expecting to spend. Um, so for the first question, uh, no, we didn't adjust the, uh, to take into account those um, figures. And the second, um, I don't know if I understand correctly, but it was uh, that Mexico was still receiving um, money from the Global Fund? Uh, yes, yes please. Not on the microphone, please. <laughs> no, uh, at the time that Mexico was a recipient from the Global Fund, it was just 2% of the total HIV expenditures. So it was a small amount. But the most, uh, where you can, uh, after the Global Fund was uh, made Mexico not, not eligible, the main set of activities which are subject to be programmed, therefore uh, allocate money more efficiently, is the annual competition for civil society organizations for uh, subsidies. So uh, in that part, it, 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 if your analysis included only that part, because what I saw, one of cat the categories was mass media. And the mass media doesn't come from the same funding source. So okay. it, you are combining two different types of, of, of elements. Yeah, great. And the mass media was mainly to, uh, for, to promote uh, service demand. 
Okay, great. Uh, understood. So, um, no, it was uh, this evaluation, it's from uh, 2015 to 2016. So that is before. Um, I mean, after. Yeah. So doesn't have it. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to respond to any of those questions in any way? And then we'll move on to the other two. Okay, great. Marcus first. And okay. One comment to uh, Tavi, one to John. Tavi, I agree with Anna that uh, what I take from your presentation is uh, first the results on the consequence of uh, shortfalls in funding in terms of health outcomes, and second, that these uh, reductions in funding are ultimately self-defeating because of the build-up in treatment needs. And I think your, your paper would benefit from conveying that storyline more consistently, including in the title, which is somewhere somewhat about the costs of financing under different funding scenarios, which does not really convey well what the paper is about. Um, one comment to John, working uh, on the Namibia investment case, uh, including applying this goals analysis with one of your colleagues. Uh, one, of, one of the results that we found was that by far the most important intervention in terms of attaining HIV prevention targets and driving the costs of the HIV program was bringing down viral uh, suppression and uh, transmission uh, rates on treatment and in the results in the framework and goals that you presented this is not reflected you may argue that this is more a matter of technical progress but still uh, there are a couple of measures which need to be taken to achieve these outcomes and they have a direct impact on HIV prevention outcomes and I'm uh, I'm uh, concerned that this unit cost uh, enabled and driven analysis that you are presenting is missing the point on this central aspect of uh, achieving uh, positive uh, program outcomes. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll take the answers to uh, John first and then Tabby, I think. Yeah, so in answer to Marcus's question, um, that's true. The analysis I presented was just at the sort of the category level of interventions. Um, the next phase of this work is actually looking at the, the full treatment cascade. So interventions, uh, there's a, we're adding to the goals model a testing component so you can devise the most cost-effective testing strategies to reach the first 90. Um, adherence, um, uh, linkage intervention, so what once somebody's identified as HIV positive, what do we need to do to get them linked to care effectively? And then the third component is viral suppression. Um, what interventions do we have for improving adherence? And so we're gathering the evidence on how much those interventions cost, how effective they are, and um, that, so that's the next phase of the work is to incorporate that because that's, that's where it's all going and that's where most of the money is being spent right now. Uh, that's a very good point. Um, I think that the ultimate takeaways from our study, uh, we want to put more focus on the impact of, of different spending on health outcomes, like you said. Um, generally agree. Okay, thank you. The gentleman on uh, four, could you introduce your name and where you... Uh, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Andrew Waswa and uh, I come from Uganda. And my questions relate to the presentation on the public-private partnership. Uh, first and foremost, what was the, the period of the, the, the study with the, these institutions? Are we talking about two years, three years, five years? And during this period, did you have any situations where some staff left the institutions for one reason or another? If these staff left the institutions, did these organizations continue to look after them or not? How was that handled? And number three is uh, when you were starting with in these institutions and you know they were meant to come up with the activities they were going to do for the year, what were the drivers of these uh, activities? Was it a budget that these institutions wanted to spend on these activities for the year or it, it all started with an assessment of the organization 
who needed the help, and then everything started from there. And then uh, lastly, what was the average budgets that you were supporting for these institutions per annum? $5,000, $20,000, $50,000. Thank you very much. And then, um, I'll take the next question, and then Daniel, I'll ask you to respond to the next question, please. Thank you. Um, my name is Julia Hen. I'm with USAID. I'm based in um, the Barbados, covering the Eastern and Southern Caribbean. Uh, I have a question for my Kenyan colleague. Um, I'm very interested in what you described um, as being some of the challenges in the public-private partnership, particularly the fact that when companies, private companies, are undergoing changes in terms of their profitability, when they're experiencing market changes, um, their commitment may or may not be steady. And I'm wondering how, I, we have experienced that ourselves, not necessarily in the Caribbean, but I've seen that elsewhere, particularly with gold mining companies. And I'm wondering if you could tell me some of the strategies that you used to buffer the vulnerability of the program to those market effects. The other question that I have is, because this was a workplace program, um, how did you buffer, for example, the effect of stigma and discrimination and the fear that people would have had to step forward to their employers? And also, how did you address the issue of, of key populations within those programs? Um, or was simply because those folks face additional layers of, uh, of stigma and discrimination? Thank you. Thank you. Daniel, you have lots of questions. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I'll uh, respond to the questions. Now, number one, on the issue of the study period, the data I was looking at because of the context of this presentation was 2015, 2016, and 2017, looking at the financing bit of it. Eh? But then the, the learnings and the lessons, they range from the beginning of the program way back in 2004 up to uh, up to now. The program has been there since 2004 until, it's, it's, uh, until now, and it's going on. Um, yes, <coughs> of course, there, there, there is always like uh, employees who would join and leave the companies. But then <coughs> what we have in place is that uh, the programs have inbuilt mechanisms for induction for new employees joining the, the companies so that they are taken through what is already existing, policy uh, dissemination, briefing on the policy, and basically also companies organizing sessions specifically for them, the new employees. Uh, there are those who leave the companies and maybe they are on treatment can support. Normally what companies would do is to have a transfer mechanism. We have seen some companies also, <coughs> because probably they have capacity in, in resources, they're able to follow them up and still continue supporting them even when they, are, they have left the organization. But referral uh, transfer to other systems has been the best mechanism for sustainability to just make sure that they don't lose out on treatment care and support. Uh, in terms of the drivers of the activities initially, I mentioned that uh, the entry point is a collaboration between management and workers but also we recommend baseline surveys as a starting point. In fact, for most companies, we have what we call a startup kit, where we conduct <coughs> baseline surveys, the CAP surveys, uh, to be able to use that to advocate the management on why they should buy into the program and even engage subsequent activities. So very much so, we do conduct baseline surveys at the entry point. Uh, in terms of average budget, we, the funding we have uh, overall, we've had like annually a budget of around 12 million Swedish krona. Uh, but then what goes like into the core funding is say, for example, 70% of, of, of that, that, that budget. Because of course, then the companies I mentioned, absorptive capacity may differ. They may not necessarily claim <coughs> what they, sub they committed to, to implementation because of different reasons. Then uh, uh, the, other qu the other set of questions, uh, companies experiencing difficulties and what happens is actually a cross-running cross uh, example. 
uh, which happens across the board. Uh, but what we have done or even seen working best is capacitating the, the respective committees in the different workplaces to, get, to take charge of their programs and even to continue with the uh, activities uh, where the companies are not able to, to commit equal finances where they experience difficulties. We have a couple of good examples where companies went through difficulties and even uh, changes that uh, really laid off employees. But then, because we had steering committees there, they were still able to continue with the activities, internal activities, coordination. The peer educators who were capacitated were able also to continue uh, with the activities at the companies. So to us, building capacity around the steering committees, the peer educators, has an element of a low-cost way of sustaining those programs. Uh, then uh, addressing stigma and discrimination uh, as a, an important component of the programs is policies that borrow a lot from the ILO Recommendations 200, where we, of course, uphold non-discriminative practices there is provision for that, that every program must have a policy and that the committees, the peer educators, they must know the con that what is contained in the policies and that they must disseminate that to all the employees. We have had exceptional cases where uh, employees who have been living positively come out and become champions themselves because as living examples that the company have upheld their rights then no one then becomes afraid or scared of uh, testing because maybe they're going to be laid off or otherwise. And that, that actually has really motivated others to take up the services. Uh, so uh, then by extension, uh, companies have also gone to the community, reaching to key populations where they put them together, group them together, conduct uh, activities, uh, education awareness around them, and they also empower them uh, to even, for example, start income generating activities where they have not had before. And so there are different examples coming from different countries and regions. Thank you, very clear and comprehensive answer. Okay, uh, Doug, if you could introduce yourself and. Uh, thanks, Anna. I'm Doug Webb from UN Development Program in New York. Um, Thank you, panelists. Very interesting. You've been quite um, careful in quantifying and describing these allocative inefficiencies and under expenditures on some interventions and some populations. Um, when confronted with this evidence, presumably there's a mean ability to change in policy and expenditure based on the fact that these could be honest miscalculations or honest mistakes in, in expenditures. But some under expenditures may persist Oh, in the, in, despite this evidence being presented. Um, and I'm interested whether you're thinking that this might reflect perhaps structural discriminations or consistent patterns of deliberate under-expenditure, and whether we are anywhere close to having some kind of proxy measure or proxy um, indicator of the, 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 the structural discriminations and expenditures, particularly in respect to key populations, and whether these methods that you're describing will allow us to actually look at these structural costs of discrimination in when there's perpetual under-expenditure and whether then we, we start looking at this as a proxy of political capital um, for the value of not spending money in those areas, if you get my. So I think we're trying to, is, are we on the way to some kind of proxy of, of, of the, the cost of structural discrimination here? Thanks. Okay, I'm going to ask John <laughs> first to respond to that, and then if anyone else would like to um, add, and then I'll take your question before we leave. We've just got enough time. Thanks. So I think first we should recognize that there are um, a lot of considerations that come to hand in allocating resources, that cost effectiveness is one of them, but it's far from the only one, um, and even the only appropriate one. But yes, there certainly are um, lots of reasons that are not good reasons for uh, allocating money and discrimination and, and uh, concern about 
politics, et cetera, is another one. So yes, we can. We, in fact, we have, um, you know, we run the model with ideal allocation, and then we run the model with current allocation, and we can see the difference. In fact, the Global Fund has, you know, they have a series of key performance indicators to measure their progress that they report onto the board every year. And one of their key performance indicators, number four, is on efficiency. <clears throat> um, and what they try to report on is improvements in efficiency of the programs, where the um, inefficiencies come when you're spending money on things that don't have as much impact as things that do. And the measure is the improvement in efficiency over time. And the idea is that the Global Fund is trying to um, stimulate better allocation of funds so they can measure their progress in terms of that improved efficiency. Anyone else like to add on that? I don't know, in Mexico and, and here, whether you want to add anything to that? Not to put you on the spot, it's okay if you don't. <laughs> Okay, but well, that's an interesting question, and I agree with John. I think it's quite easy to turn the analyses that we're all doing. You also did a, a allocative efficiency analysis um, to look at the costs in terms of health impact of, of discrimination or inequities. Um, of course, sometimes they're aligned, and sometimes there's a trade-off between equity and and that. But it's a very good question. Final question. The honour goes to you. Hi, my name is Austin. I'm from IHME and the University of Washington. John, I'm curious about the quality of the data for the key populations and whether or not that's something that's improving and how important that is to the sensitivity of the, the cost-effectiveness analysis. Good question. So, yeah, we have lots of data. You saw lots of numbers up there. Some of it's good. <laughs> Much of it isn't. Um, so the data I presented come from investment cases. So in each country, the process might have been a little bit different. In some countries, there was uh, quite a bit of investment made to, to actually visit implementing partners and find out what their costs are and their, their, out, their reach to sort of calculate pretty good unit costs. Other countries um, didn't have much at all, <clears throat> and they had to resort to looking at uh, regional averages or neighboring countries. But at least in all cases, this was a decision taken by the team doing the investment case in the country that these were the best costs they had. So um, I would say, you know, in the PEPFAR-supported countries, those costs are known pretty well because there's such an emphasis on cost effectiveness. In other countries, it's, um, it's really a mixed bag. And it, it certainly makes a difference, <laughs> no question. To, to clarify, just the data on key population sizes. So I know well, that key that's, population sizes. Yeah, that that's hard to <laughs> estimate. And so I'm curious whether or not that's important for this analysis. Um, it's important for the resource needs estimate, not so much for the cost effectiveness, because that gets at how much it's costing you to reach people you are reaching. But in order to uh, reach our targets, we have to know yeah, how many people are out there. Um, so there are a lot of meth different ways for estimating sizes of key populations. Um, they all. Um, suffer from, from a problem in that um, both when we measure prevalence and size, we can do it at capital cities or in, in large cities um, and get pretty good information. But then in order to estimate resource needs, we have to apply it to the whole country. And if 3% of people are, are men have sex with men in a capital city, that doesn't necessarily mean we can apply that 3% to the whole country. But it's very difficult to make those same population size estimates for rural populations. So that's a major limitation. OK, we're almost exactly on time. So we're going to finish now. But I'd like you to join me in I thank think there is one another oh, question. Oh, yeah, I just want to check the time because we do want people to leave. OK, you've got maybe a comment. Go on. No, 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 that's fine. I'll take it up with him after. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so th thanks to the presenters, their great presentations, their clear answers, keeping to time. It was wonderful. And, and please come up, and I'm sure they'll welcome any additional questions or, or comments. Thank you.